It's time for another episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show, a podcast where I connect you with thought leaders from across the globe, digging into some of my favorite topics like personal development, marketing, spirituality, and pretty much any other shiny object that happens to catch my attention. Today, my special guest is Joel Richardson, and we're going to be discussing his brand new book, Sinai to Zion, The Untold Story of the Triumphant Return of Jesus. Joel, it is always an honor to speak with you. Welcome back to the show. Sean, it's always great to talk to you. Thanks for having me on. Well, it's been, gosh, I don't know, a year, year and a half. I don't quite remember the time frame, but it's been a while since you've been on the show. My show has been growing by leaps and bounds, so I have a bunch of new folks who may not know quite who you are. So uh, let's kick this off by having you share a little bit of the Joel Richardson origin story. For somebody meeting you for the first time in our talk today, what are a few things you need to know about you and your ministry? The Joel Richardson origin story. That's uh, I haven't heard it framed that way. <laughs> well, I would say for those who aren't familiar, I mean, I'm an itinerant minister. I uh, travel primarily domestically, but really all over the world and uh, teaching on the end times, the return of Jesus, the gospel, um, the gospel of the kingdom, and just preparing the church for many of the great challenges that we're facing, interestingly, this year, and we'll continue to have to navigate uh, in the days ahead. And uh, I really enjoy doing that. I'm much more of a teacher uh, than a preacher. But, um, you know, I'll often be found, yes, speaking in local congregations and different things, but also some of these larger prophecy conferences. So obviously, depending on where you are in the body of Christ, the prophecy world is kind of its own unique culture. And, um, and I enjoy doing that. Sometimes that world can be very unusual. Um, some might even look at it. Uh, you know, is even a bit freakish at times. And I think, I think that's fair. Sometimes it is. Um, but I enjoy speaking into that world. But my heart, while I'm often, uh, I'll say, doing this um, on the forefront, you know, to pay the bills. I mean, this is where you'll usually see me is at the Prophecy Conferences. My heart is really missions. And so I'm involved in a handful of different ministries that are primarily working in the underground church, um, in the Middle East, so in the Persian-speaking world, Iran, Syria, um, Iraq, throughout this part of the world, obviously. And that's my, that's my passion, is just to be close to what the Lord is doing, and he's moving throughout the Middle East. So um, it's, uh, it's an interesting combination, um, the missions and the end times. And, um, you know, I try to speak to these things in a, in a very level-headed and biblically sound way. So... I think that's probably what I'm most known for, and I'm trying to trying to maintain that as much as possible. Yeah, you're one of those unique authors and leaders who you kind of span a few different spaces. You definitely can speak into that uh, kind of off-the-beaten-path prophecy conference crowd, or as I think as uh, Michael Heiser likes to call it, kind of Christian Middle Earth sometimes, where there's just a lot, people are talking about a whole lot of different stuff. Um, and you also kind of touch into that like mainstream evangelical space. So it's it's not every author who can sort of uh, bridge different spaces, but I feel like you do a good job of speaking into uh, both of those unique territories. Uh, one of the things that's always impressed me, Joel, in terms of um, your writing, obviously you have a passion for talking about the end times, but um, really your, your personal passion for the return of Jesus. Uh, you know, my, my life is consumed with the Christian book industry. I've been in the publishing space for a decade, been podcasting for nine years, interviewing authors uh, and such, um, but you're probably the most passionate person I've encountered uh, when it comes to talking about the return of Jesus. So in terms of that passion in your life, like where, where did that come from? How did that start uh, rising up within you, if you will? So I'm a big picture guy. So, you know, I, as much as I enjoy getting into some of the finer points of theology, I, I tend to avoid, I'll say some of those debates, you know, to, to really haggle over the, Calvinism, Arminianism, or, you know, any number of, we could list 15 different uh, subjects. I tend to be a big picture guy, which is to say, I love the larger story of redemption as the Bible tells it. And I really like to understand that story as it has been progressively revealed throughout the entire biblical narrative. And so in many ways, I am an Old Testament guy. Um, I spend probably a much greater percentage of my time in the Old Testament because I believe the New Testament is really largely just an expansion upon an exposition of the Old Testament. And I think the more that I peer into the scriptures, the more that I understand that the primary overwhelming focal point of all hope and expectation, 
The gospel itself points to the day of the Lord, the return of Jesus, the restoration of all things, as it's referred to by Peter, of which all the prophets have been speaking, really from the beginning. They've been speaking of this time of redemption, which I often categorize it as, um, characterize it as essentially um, a combination of a new and greater Eden and a new and greater kingdom of David. You combine those two biblical concepts and just add a bit of glory and glitter. And, uh, you know, you're kind of beginning to get a picture of what the age to come is, is framed as um, throughout the Bible. And of course, the return of Jesus is referred to as our blessed hope, the anchor of hope for our souls. I mean, again, this is the omega point because this is the transition from this current wicked age, this tired age, this exhausting age, this sinful age, this corrupt age. And it's the transition into the age to come. So that's, you know, it's, it's Christian, it's biblical hope. And I think if anything this past year has demonstrated is that we as a people, um, it's okay. You know, it's okay if we're in, involved in this world. In fact, we should. We should be engaged. But the, our ultimate hope, the, the main expression of what we're meditating upon, thinking upon, looking forward to, hoping and talking about, et cetera, et cetera, it should be the return of Jesus in the age to come because that is the essence of the good news. Yeah, I think that is definitely one of the blessings of this year, although it has been a very difficult year. It has put people in a position to just wrestle with the hard things. I feel like for many of us here in the West, especially here in the United States, this may be the first time we've had to wrestle with, does my faith mean anything? Does my theology mean anything? Where we have to start going, well, I always say this is a truth, but now I'm actually struggling to have to see, does this work out? Can I live this out? And so uh, although it's been difficult, I feel like it's been a real blessing where we can put our beliefs to the test in a way that sharpens us. So it might not be fun all the time, but in my mind, that is a good thing. Uh, you know, Joel, as, as I've been following you the past, you know, three, four years or anybody who follows your ministry between what you've been teaching about, writing about, you've been working on a lot of fascinating things uh, the past few years, which in part result in this book that we're talking about today. But just tell us about some of the the trails you've gone down, so to speak, the past few years where that's taking you and how that kind of leads us into this book today. Yeah, so interesting. I'll actually take it back a bit further. So my first book, Islamic Antichrist, it was originally published under a different title, but I mean, I really wrote that back in 2004. And so initially, again, I was reaching out to Muslims. I was engaged in evangelism uh, to Muslims, but I wrote this book which addresses their eschatology. And then that led into developing what I'll call the Middle Eastern or Islamic end time theory, the idea that the Antichrist, his empire, and his religion would ultimately come out of the Middle East and in all likelihood would be expressed through some form of Islam, as opposed to this very Euro or Roman-centric perspective that is, um, has been an alternative perspective with regard to the end times. Now, again, that's, that's kind of end time uh, trivia. I mean, you know, there's kind of an example of an issue that you could really get into. Um, but I tried to do that really well. I thought if I'm going to present this, I want to present the case well. And of course, that's what plunged me into the whole world of biblical prophecy and, and essentially being viewed at, as an end time teacher. Um, but then I'm going to say several years ago, uh, another book, which was sort of outside of the trilogy of these um, books that I've been writing on that subject, and it was when a Jew rules the world. And so there I was dealing with really, I mean, all things related to Israel. A lot of it did have to do with biblical prophecy, but essentially how theology impacts the way that we treat people and particularly how the church has treated the Jewish people down through history and why eschatology matters. You know, so much of the church thinks, well, that's just kind of irrelevant fringe stuff, but it has profound application into in terms of how we relate to God's people, quite frankly. So that was um, sort of my first step in terms of stepping outside of being pigeonholed into being, nobody wants to be the Antichrist guy, um, or maybe some do, I don't. Um, but interestingly, then the journey took a very interesting turn uh, a couple of years ago, I guess three and a half years ago now, where I had the opportunity to uh, slip into Saudi Arabia. Before it was open, it's now open to tourism. Of course, it's not with COVID. 
they just opened and then COVID hit and it was shut, shut back down. But um, I had the chance to go to Saudi Arabia and investigate what I believe is the real Mount Sinai. And that led to a year journey of investigation um, where I eventually wrote a book called Mount Sinai in Arabia. I think that's actually the last time we talked. I could be wrong. Um, but essentially through that, the Lord just has had me parked in the Exodus, um, in the book of Exodus and the story of the Exodus. And, you know, while it, 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 for some, maybe this is just, well, you know, of course, but for me, I, what I came to realize is how significant the story of the Exodus is within the larger biblical narrative, the story of redemption, but also as it pertains to the return of Jesus. And so my latest book, Sinai to Zion, the untold story of the triumphant return of Jesus, is um, putting, uh, is making the connections, is showing how the, the entire Bible, including the New Testament, frames the story of the return of Jesus as the second or the greater or the ultimate exodus. And the story of the exodus is the key that unlocks the story of the return of Jesus. And that's how Jesus, Peter, Paul, and John all would have understood it. And that's how they frame it. And once we sort of open that door, then it's amazing how the story of the return of Jesus opens up and, and a lot of details emerge in, in often lost or ignored Old Testament texts um, that are just beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Well, I think anytime we can get people to uh, connect with the Old Testament at all is a good thing these days. I feel like uh, as Christians, we often spend way too much time, well, really in the Gospels or the broader New Testament and almost no time in the Old Testament at all. And uh, it's, you have a much more healthy perspective of Scripture if you know the Bible in its entirety because it's all connected. Uh, but uh, So yeah, anything that gets people in the Old Testament tends to get me pretty excited. I think for this uh, next part of the interview, Joel, I'd love to have us just briefly touch into part one, part two, part three of the book. Um, would love to have you give us kind of a, a, a sort of a sweeping overview of maybe some of the high points or however it is most comfortable for you to kind of give us an overview of the book. You, you cover so much ground, so let's give them a taste of what they can discover there. So part one, the marriage covenant at Mount Sinai. Yep. So essentially, yeah, as you said, I break the book up into three parts. The first part deals with just the story of the Exodus, and I show how <clears throat> it was intended by the Lord. And it's the, the story is painted as a love story. It's a romance. It is Yahweh himself romancing and wooing Israel in the process of saving her out of uh, slavery, out of Egypt. And then ultimately, the, uh, the covenant at Mount Sinai is cast and framed as a marriage covenant, a marriage covenant between God and his people Israel. And that's the way that it's uh, understood and looked back to throughout the Bible. And I work through a lot of the various um, components of the covenant and how they relate to a biblical wedding um, and sort of break it down. And so that's, um, that's a, it's a nice uh, study. It's a fantastic Bible study. In fact, part one, in many ways, it could just be broken off as its own separate book. Um, and I wrestled with that. I, by the way, I tried to write the shortest book that I've written, and it ended up being the longest. Um, <laughs> and I probably would have been better to break it up, but I thought it was important to keep it all together. So then in part two, I'm dealing with the, um, the logical, or not logical, but the, the extension of this idea as it unfolds throughout the biblical narrative, throughout the story of redemption. And so again, we need to understand it, first of all, in the Old Testament, it's framed as a very Israel-centric story. And so in part two, I'm laying out the story of the historical chastisement of, of God chastising his people because of their lack of faithfulness to the marriage covenant, as he promised, by the way, within the covenant. So I call this the covenant chastisement cycle. Um, it's a cycle that essentially involves you know, if Israel does not obey the covenant, the marriage vows, so to speak, um, the Lord says, I'll bring various calamities, you know, beasts, you'll have problems with your crops and so forth. But it culminates with various national calamities, um, culminating with Israel being invaded, being destroyed, most of her people being killed and exiled among the Gentiles. And he lays this out very clearly in Torah. Well, of course, we can just look at history. This has happened multiple times in Israel's history with the Babylonian exile partially with the northern Assyrian exile, happened again over about a 50-year period in the first century with the Roman exile. 
And of course, each time the Lord brings them back because he also promised that he would do that. And so the story of Israel's chastisement, humiliation, restoration, and salvation, which culminates with the restoration of the marriage covenant. Or even you could say um, the covenant at Mount Sinai was a betrothal ceremony, but the ultimate marriage ceremony is yet to come. So the the final cycle of the Lord chastising Israel is yet to come. The Bible refers to this as the time of Jacob's trouble. And I show how the Lord tells the story that he's going to bring Israel back out into the wilderness, into the desert of the Exodus. He's going to bring them back to that place of suffering, but also refuge and salvation. And it's there in the time of their most desperate hour that he's going to return and save them and thus uh, ultimately have the the wedding um, in Jerusalem. And the Bible tells that story. So that's part two. Now in part three, for me, is the most exciting part of the book. This is where I work through all of the specific prophecies, not all of them, but many of the most important foundational prophecies throughout the Old Testament that tell this story. And what I show is that the story of Israel's ultimate restoration, of which we, who are Gentile believers, um, become part of because we're children of Abraham by faith. So we're part of the story. Um, I show how the Bible frames the return of Jesus as Yahweh, God Almighty, coming back from heaven with all of his angels to save his people. And it is the second or greater exodus. And there is a literal procession. There is a literal march through the desert. Yahweh leading his people as he's saving them from Sinai to Zion, where he is enthroned as King Messiah over, uh, over this restored throne of David. And it's a, it's a story that you go, you know, wait a minute. If my understanding of the return of Jesus is only uh, informed by my reading of, for example, Revelation 19 and a handful of other references throughout the New Testament, it's a very truncated story. It's a very minimalist story. He kind of returns from heaven with his angels. He, he waves his magic wand, so to speak, all things new. But what I do is I show the foundation text, the foundation prophecies, which the New Testament is drawing from. And it's a much fuller picture, much more texture, many more details, much more color and vibrance and emotion and poetry. And uh, so as a result of this, we look at, again, some often forgotten passages that are just stunningly beautiful. And my hope is that it will rekindle excitement within the church for this culmination of redemption, the story of the return of Jesus, because it really is at the heart of the entire uh, biblical story. Well, Joel, I guess if you had to, and you may have already answered this, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, in terms of the connections you want people to make across parts one, two, and three, sort of that ultimate takeaway, or they're somehow like shifted in their journey? How do you hope you've impacted them along the way as they're reading the book? Well, again, by using, by, by taking a big picture approach, you know, sort of the, the 30,000 foot view, um, my hope is that, and it's a fantastic overview of the entire story of redemption, is that it will simply open the scriptures up. Um, it will open the scriptures up to the most integral central part. When the Old Testament is opened up, it's wonderful. Most Christians uh, I'd say a large percentage of Christians, they look at the prophets and they're lost. They don't know how it fits, what it pertains to. But when you start recognizing these repeated common themes and motifs, and you understand the story as it's told, then you can turn to anything. You can turn to Hosea, you can turn to Joel, you can turn to Isaiah, and you realize, oh, wow, they're all basically telling the same story. They're pointing back to the covenant at Mount Sinai, and they're pointing forward to the coming of God. And, and the salvation of Israel, the restoration of Israel, the restoration of the throne of David. And, um, you know, when I, when I was a kid, I used to have a reoccurring dream where I would find a secret doorway or a passageway, uh, maybe in the back of a closet in my house to a secret room that I never knew existed. You know, I grew up in this house and all of a sudden I didn't know we had a game room, you know, or whatever behind the bathroom or whatever. And as a kid, it, it, I would wake up with this excitement and I would go looking for it. And um, essentially that's what I'm trying to do with the Bible because the Bible is that way. It just unfolds and unfolds and unfolds. And when it opens up, it's very exciting. It's, it's, it's exhilarating and you want to dig into the scriptures. You want to 
you know, discover all of these rooms that have been there all along, but you just didn't realize it. And that was sort of my experience in writing the book. And I'm hoping that it will have that uh, effect for those that read it as well. Well, Joel, thank you for that overview of what we're going to encounter when we read this new book. Um, as we've already mentioned earlier in the interview, uh, 2020 has been an interesting year. We're recording this conversation in early December. You know, I think for many of us between coronavirus, the U.S. presidential election and everything else, like we've been glued to social media and the news and very focused on what's happening here in the United States. But I feel like a lot of us have lost touch with what is happening throughout this year in the broader world. So I'd love to have you just give us a little bit of commentary um, from your perspective, what's been unfolding this year that we should at least be paying attention to, whether we're talking about Turkey and the Middle East, uh, other places in the globe, uh, more in the terms of kind of that end times prophecy unfolding uh, kind of cycle in the season that we're in, uh, what should at least be on, on our minds a little bit right now? Well, you know, it's actually fascinating. Um, I probably wouldn't have gone there, but since you asked, I mean, Turkey has continued to march forward in terms of their advancing uh, neo ottomanism um, emerging in terms of a regional power player. Um, there's sort of this coalition forming, these two coalitions forming in many ways with the Abrahamic Accords. That's a huge issue um, that's unfolded. And what we essentially have is, I'll say, the formation of these two blocks. Um, and according to Daniel chapter 11, we have the formation right before our eyes. I mean, it's, it's continuing to come into focus of what I'll call the King of the North block or the King of the North coalition. That's the coalition of the Antichrist and some of his more radical um, uh, nations that he's allied with, as well as the emergence of the King of the South block, which is a bit more friendly to Israel. And so with the Abrahamic Accords, we have the UAE and Bahrain, who are joining the previous nations of Egypt and Jordan. We see Sudan jumping on board, potentially Saudi Arabia, um, Oman, et cetera, et cetera. Morocco could be uh, in the hopper. And these are nations that are essentially saying, look, we want positive economic relations and, and just personal relations with Israel, as well as the West, the United States. So this is the king of the South Bloc. Um, of which Egypt is largely the, the foundation, uh, the most populous Arab nation in, in the world. Uh, and then in the north, you have Turkey is sort of taking the lead in this King of the North coalition. Um, so Qatar, Iran, Russia, as well as um, Syria, Bashar Assad, and Hezbollah, and the Hashd al-Shabi in Iraq, and so forth. So we see the emergence of this more radical bloc. And that really is exactly what Daniel described in the last day. So that's huge. Now, in a big picture, I would say the Lord has been about the business of John 15, the parable of the vine, and he's been pruning. He's been pruning all of us, and we've been forced, we've been forced into uh, a fast of sorts. Um, a lot of our comforts uh, have been removed and so forth. Finances are being pruned. Emotions are being pruned. Uh, our hopes and all sorts of worldly things are being pruned. And so ultimately, I think he's forcing us to fix our eyes on the gospel, to fix our eyes on the hope set before us, which, as I said previously, is his return, is the end of this current tired, corrupt system that's wearing out. And soon he's going to return and reestablish the throne of David from Jerusalem and the knowledge of God will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea and the law of Messiah will go forth from Jerusalem and all the nations will stream to it. So that's the beautiful picture that we're looking forward to, as I said, the greater Eden combined with the greater kingdom of David. And that's an exciting thing to get our eyes fixed on as the Lord continues to wean us um, from our addiction to the things of this age. And in addition to the new book that we're talking about today, in terms of your previous books, anything you would recommend to, to help us kind of wrestle with and, uh, and unpack what we're seeing in this season? You know, there's bits and pieces in all of them, um, Mideast Beast, um, even Islamic Antichrist continues to play out, as well as Mystery Babylon, where I, I, it's my exposition of Revelation 17 and 18, has some relevance. And, and really, in terms of what we're talking about with Sinai, even my book, which just discusses the location of Mount Sinai, Mount Sinai in Arabia, um, is helpful. They all sort of, they're all sort of intertwined to some degree, but, um, but I'm, I'm, to be honest, I'm most excited about Sinai design. I think it'll probably be the most important, um, monumental book that I've ever written and perhaps may ever write. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's been a, a, a 
tough few years to get through and, and get this book done, but I'm really excited that it's finally out there. Angel, uh, it's almost time for us to wrap up, but uh, before we do that, we'd love for you to just take a few moments to pray for the viewers and the listeners. Would you do that for us? Yeah. So Father, I thank you so much. We thank you for everyone that's uh, tuning in um, shortly after the, this recording or even many, many months later. We just ask that right now, that uh, those watching as they join us in prayer, that your, hand, <clears throat> that your hand would rest on them and that together you would cause your people to turn our eyes to you, to the culmination of that which we've been waiting for. All of creation is groaning and waiting. You, Lord, you said that you're in us. Your spirit is groaning, groaning for that time. And we ask that you would give us grace to let go of the things of this world which would cause us even to hate the things of this world, not the things of this planet per se, but the, the, uh, this current sinful and corrupt system, this failing system, this tired system, that you would help us to fully fix our hope, our ultimate hope on uh, the country that uh, is coming, so to speak, the, the nation, the kingdom that's coming, the time when we will no longer pray to you, but we will actually see you with our eyes and our glorified, resurrected, immortal bodies. We look forward to that time and we thank you for these things. We commit them to you in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you for that, Joel. And for the listeners, the viewers who'd like to connect with you, find out more about your ministry, your resources, where can we discover you on the web? So I'm at joelstrumpet.com. And uh, I also put up a lot of my teachings on YouTube. So if you just type in Joel Richardson, my program is called The Underground, um, but it should be pretty easy to find. But joelstrumpet.com. And then I'm also um, flapping my gums at, Joel's, uh, at joel7richardson on Twitter. And like we do with every episode, we'll have detailed links in the show notes, places where you can connect with Joel and pick up your very own copy of this brand new book. It's time to bring this episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show to a close. Many thanks for being a part of my conversation with Joel Richardson. Once again, our book today was Sinai to Zion, The Untold Story of the Triumphant Return of Jesus. Again, if you want to connect with Joel and find out more, a great place to start is his website. You can find that over at joelstrumpet.com. And Joel, I just want to say thank you so much for sharing with us today. It's always an honor. It's always a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much, Sean. Honor's mine.